Good news, good news. Always good news. Good news, good news. There is good news today. No matter what else is happening in the world. Always good news. Good news. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. If I were to ask you to define the word salt, S-A-L-T, how would you define it? Well, you know, it, it might kind of stump you a little bit because we, we use salt all the time. It's very important, but when it comes to a definition for it, how would we define it? We're going to talk about that today. I kind of like the way one little boy defined it. He said, salt is the stuff that makes things taste bad when it's left out. <laughs> well, that's true. When it's left out, it does make things taste bad because salt is a flavoring agent, but it's also a preserving agent. And in our text today, in our devotional time, we're going to talk not only about salt, but also about light. Yes, we're going to look at what Jesus said in the great sermon on the mount. Get your Bibles and open them to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 13 through 16. Thanks so much for being with us. Hope you have your Bibles now and you're ready to read along from the great Sermon on the Mount from the Master Teacher himself as we look at verses 13 through 16 where Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. back for the study portion of our devotional time and uh, we are reading today of course and studying today from the great sermon on the mount particularly the segment where jesus is talking about the power of influence and that's really how we would summarize this text we read a few moments ago listen to the verses again matthew 5 verses 13 through 16 you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. 
you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And then verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What a powerful text this is on the subject of, of influence. You know, sometimes uh, people uh, tend to diminish their personal influence. Well, the, who am I influencing, they may ask. Am I really influencing anyone? Well, the poet long ago wrote, uh, no man is an island, but by inspiration, uh, Paul long before that said, no man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. In other words, we are going to exert an influence over someone, chances are over many people. And so we need to recognize the power of that influence. And of course, we need to exert that influence as a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, then you cannot possibly be in compliance with what Jesus is saying here about letting your light shine, about being the salt of the earth, about being uh, the light uh, of the world. Of course, when Jesus lived among men, he referred to himself among other great statements, beginning with I am, he referred to himself as the light of the world. I am the light of the world, but that, that light of the world has gone back to the right hand of the Father on high. And we today, as Christians, if we are Christians, are to be reflectors of that light. He has left us with that responsibility, yea, really, that privilege, that privilege of being a powerful influence for good to encourage others to become Christians and to remain Christians and to grow as Christians and to ultimately go home to eternity in heaven as faithful child, children of God. Now, his first figure here, you are the salt of the earth. As we mentioned at the, uh, in the introduction of the program today, we like the little boy's uh, definition of salt. Uh, the stuff that makes things taste bad when it's left out. Well, that is one way of putting it. Salt is a, a flavoring agent. And we, when we look at Christians from that standpoint, we are to be a flavoring agent in this world in which we live. This is a world of darkness, darkened by sin. And uh, we are to, uh, to be a preserving agent and a flavoring uh, agent. But you know, when you think about salt in relation to curing meat and how salt is used to preserve and cure meat, that salt, in order to do its job, has to come into contact with the meat, doesn't it? And Christians, as the salt of the earth, they have to come into contact with those who populate the earth. In other words, we have to look for opportunities, take advantage of opportunities to speak a good word for Christ, to invite others to the worship uh, of the church, to Bible classes, to invite them to gospel meetings if we are members of the church. In other words, we have to be evangelistically minded, looking for opportunities to comply with what the Lord tells us we are if we're Christians, and that is the salt of the earth. I think about the flavoring agent uh, of salt, and I think about my, my dad uh, who had heart problems for many, many years, and so he was on what we would today call a bland diet. In other words, he couldn't use a lot of salt, and I remember as a, as a young boy, I remember sitting at the dinner table on one occasion in particular, and um, he was mentioning something about the food not, a, not having a lot of flavor. He w was not really complaining, just commenting about it. And, and I thought his plate looked really tempting and really good. And I said, well, it looks really good to me. And then he offered me a bite of his food. And I took a bite, and I realized what he was saying and how important salt is in, uh, in our food. Indeed, it was, uh, it was pretty bland. So it is a flavoring agent. It is a, it is a preserving agent. And Jesus says, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? In other words, we need to make sure that the, we are truly following God's word so that we can truly influence people with that word, not with any perversion of the word, not with the teachings and traditions of men, but 
with the pure teaching of Christ. Therefore, it is absolutely imperative that we make sure that we have brought our lives into complete harmony with the will of God, that we have become Christians, that we have obeyed the teachings of Christ and not the teachings of men. Remember what Jesus said on one occasion to those Jews of his day, in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We need to make sure that we've complied with the commandments of Christ that we have truly become Christians being added to his church through our obedience to the gospel, having believed it, believing that Jesus is the Christ, repenting of our sins, turning our back upon sin, confessing Jesus to be the Christ, and then being buried with him in baptism for the forgiveness of sins, as the Bible teaches. Then he adds us to the church we read about in the New Testament, the pre-denominational church of Christ, the church that belongs to him, not a denomination among denominations. We can get past all of that. We can come back to the simple, pure word of God and strike hands in unity across that word and that word only. And we must do that in order to truly be the salt of the earth and, of course, the light of the world. And so we move to that second figure that Jesus uses. You are the light of the world, verse 14, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. What this reminds us of is that we do not want to hide ourselves. You know, the idea of monasticism, going away into some monastery somewhere and hiding oneself away, that's totally contrary to what Jesus teaches here and throughout the New Testament. We are to, to uh, be like that city on a hill uh, with the light shining brightly that cannot be hidden. He continues with that figure by talking about the lamp that is not lit and then put under a basket, but on a lampstand so that it gives light to all who are in the house. And then he comes to really a concluding, a culminating, a climactic thought here uh, in verse 16. Let your light, in other words, therefore is the idea, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I have a sermon I've developed from this verse that time doesn't permit us to look at in detail here, but, but let's just look briefly at, at some points here. Let your light, in other words, not somebody else's light, that's not what is going to save you in the final analysis. It's your light. It may be that one may be a member of a faithful congregation, but unless one is an active faithful member of that congregation, then the lights that are shining all around you aren't going to get you to heaven. You have to make it personal. And so let your light shows that the light is to be personal. The influence is to be personal. And let it so shine. It is projectable. In other words, it has, to, it has to be projected. And the phrase before men shows us it's perceivable. We need to realize that it's going to be seen. People are going to see what we do. They are going to hear what we say. So let your personal light so shine, project, before men be perceived that they may see, again perceive, your good works. Ah, your good works. That tells us that the light must be productive. We must be productive as lights in the world and as the salt of the earth. We can't sit by and do nothing. We must be active servants. And then, here's an exciting part of this verse, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That tells us that the influence is also perpetual. In other words, your influence may lead to someone's obeying the gospel of Christ if you've obeyed it and you are letting that light shine and they perceive it and you're productive with it, it can become perpetual because as they obey, they may in turn and hopefully will let their light shine to others who may see their influence, be drawn to the truth through that influence and obey it. Oh, it's an exciting prospect. 